Janet can't be here, is that right? She's, right. She's with her mom. Okay. Uh, first of all, let, let me just say this. Uh, girls, could you give me back? You guys did awesome work on the Old Testament outlines. That, that is just, I cannot tell you how that encourages me to see how much effort all of you are putting into that. Um, I want you to have this because it's a resource for you, right? And so uh, that's my intention with all the assignments is just kind of to look through them and, and uh, see how we're doing. But I want to get it back in your hands, and I see Russ is going through the, the old the New Testament ones as well. Uh, anyway, good quality work. Everyone's doing it. So uh, just when you thought you were catching up to things, yeah. Oh wait. There's more. There's more. There is more. It is a bonus. So uh, I know the reading schedule has you uh, the first third of getting the message. You're, that will not be due for three weeks, and you're, uh, but you're going to start on it this week if you haven't. So um, when you get this in your hand, I just want to explain really quick. Um, really only having you doing about one exercise from each chapter. So if you've already read it, you're probably going to have to go back and read. The, the, for Thursday, it's a preface in the first chapter. So And, um, and so on the, the piece of paper there that you're going to get in a minute, it says, uh, make sure I've got it right. It says, uh, do for this Thursday, do exercise one and two in chapter two. So there's no exercise in the preface. Exercise one is read 1 Samuel 17, which is the story of David and Goliath. And then it just asks a couple questions. What are the details about glass armor contribute to the message? These are observation questions, okay? So um, one of the, uh, there's a lot of different ways that uh, you have probably learned to uh, study scripture for yourself. And I would uh, propose yet another. And it's, it's simple, three simple steps. And, and it's really the way that book is set up. And that is, what does the passage say? Most people read a passage and their first comment is, this is what it means for me. And they have skipped the observation part of it, and they've skipped the interpretation part of it, and they've jumped to application. You can't jump to application until you're sure what it says, until you have the, the, the correct interpretation as best as you can come to it. And when you've got those two things under your belt, then you're ready for application. So this first chapter is, is uh, on observation. So it's pretty simple. And that handout that I gave you, just so you know, at the very top it says, I prefer typed. Uh, I know not all of you like that, but that's what I would prefer if you can do that. I don't have a length. I don't really care. I do want at least a size 12 on the font or larger so that I can read it. Okay? Like 14 would be great for me. <laughs> um, but... Uh, so, and then just place your name, which assignment it is. You can see I've given you three. That, those are the next three consecutive classes, Thursday, Monday, Thursday. And, um, and that has you reading up through. So uh, you actually have by uh, Sunday the 6th, I think it's Sunday, February 6th, you're supposed to have read through Chapter 6 anyway. So this is really, if you haven't started the Doriani book, this will get you going. And... Um, I'm not looking for length. I just, you know, interact with the material. Uh, and these are, so you'll be in the text, you'll be in the Bible. This one is, the second question on chapter 2, your first assignment is uh, Luke 15, 11 through 32, which is the story of the prodigal son. What do the details of the father's behavior in verses 20 through 24 <coughs> contribute to the story? That's an observation question. You read the passage, think about what the details that it says about the father in the story, what do those details contribute to the overall? See, most of us say, Carl's son, I know what it's all about, got it. And, and what Pastor Russ and I would, I'm certainly uh, agree on is that we don't have it because we just think we've got the whole picture because we know kind of what the story is. But the details, it's God's word. The details are never insignificant. We may not understand why they're there, but they're not insignificant. And, and the, the, the more that we interact with God's word on something as simple as observation, the more that the Lord, I believe, is going to speak to us through his word, and we will profit from it, as God intends with his word. So um, any questions about that assignment you have in your hand? Go ahead, Tim. What are the next two steps on your 
Oh, yes, yeah. you gave us one step on what the does three steps. Say? Oh, I'm sorry. Observation, interpretation. Now, what does it say? What does it, what does it say? Yeah. Second one is what does it mean? Which is a very difficult step, actually. Some passages are very obvious. Some are not so obvious at all. So the interpretation question. Uh, some would, would break the, the, uh, the third step is application. How does it work in my life? Okay. What does it say? What does it mean? How does it work in my life? Some, you'll, you'll run into some uh, programs that would break that last step into principalization. In other words, you'll be reading a passage from the Old Testament and it's about something to do with sacrificing whatever. And you'll go, well, I have nothing to do with me. Well, what's the principle that does have to do with you? All right. Well, what's the principle that we draw from that passage? I, I lump that together with application just for simplicity's sake, and when we get to that, we will talk more about that. And you'll cover, Doriani actually does a pretty good job. There's a couple of things that he leaves out in here. We will cover those things, and that's why you've got a concordance, because he actually leaves that out uh, in his discussion. But he does a really good job on some other things here. So um, if you haven't started reading this book, get into this book. You know, this first assignment, I don't think it'll take you too long, but you're going to have to do it between now and Thursday. All right? Any questions about that? All right? Good. Uh, we ha we have a lot to cover tonight. Mm -hmm. There will be the French yeah, she's coming out. You mean to do that? Yeah. She gets here. Yeah, she's going to run around and get some money. We have to get her. No, I can't get her into my groceries. It's so far for us to come back. She's here. Oh, she's here. She's here. Um, okay. Uh, Russ, well, before you do that, would you come on these out? Yep. Authenticity of the New Testament. Last week was authenticity of the Old Testament. So the, the question that we seek to answer here is how do we know, first of all, that the New Testament is actually authentic and that it, it, it is what was given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the writers of Scripture uh, and, and, and has it been faithfully preserved and how do we know that what we have is actually what was written because we have none of the originals. And so, uh, much like we address these issues in the, um, in the in the Old Testament last week, we're going to do that in the New Testament tonight. Uh, I, I've got some special things planned for you tonight, uh, and they uh, one of the things that uh, Russ and I talked about uh, when we were in the planning stages of this is that because. Uh, between us, we have more than 50 years of pastoral experience. We felt that what we needed to bring to you is not just information that, that, you know, of an academic sort, but what is practical, because that's what we deal with every day in the churches where we serve. So um, when we get into uh, uh, the transmission of the New Testament, uh, I've got some uh, articles that I grabbed off the internet. I did some research this week. Uh, first of all, on what translations are faithful and where did we get them? I can't tell you how many times people say to me, well, what Bible should I buy? That's not an easy question to answer because I'm not really sure what they want to do with the Bible. But then, then I, and I hope I don't offend anybody when I say this, but just kind of, kind of a, a general term, there's the King James only group. And uh, they're, they're just convinced that the King James is the only valid translation to buy. To That's in the original language. Yeah, yeah. I step on anybody's toes right there? That's right. The thing is, Paul never read King James, so you know they're, they're, But you're gonna you're gonna see what I believe is a very uh, uh, right on article about where the King James came from, and you're gonna be surprised. They didn't really have that good of manuscripts when Erasmus translated and, and others. What we have is the King James. It's a great translation. But to say that it's the only translation or the best translation, we will look at some of those issues. And as well as maybe the translation that you read, how faithful is it to the Word of God? So that's coming. Plus, I hope to be able to do a little bit with the Greek on you tonight because it's just a great, just a great language. Okay, so on this one, uh, on your outline, go ahead, Russ. This one is there. Okay. Oh, let's get to it. Internal proofs. Okay, I never know quite how. So the internal proofs. Um, on your notes, you only have three at ABC. Okay. So does it have listed? It doesn't. It doesn't. It's sure. Oh, there. Okay. There it is. It's out of Given by God. K. 
kept by God. So this is similar to the New Testament. If we have, if we are convinced that God's Word tells us that that uh, this book that we have in our hands is the Word of God, then the, we believe that it is a theistic God. So He's involved. He's very much involved. So He's the one who gives His Word, and because He's involved and He's present in the world today and accessible by those who would seek Him, He keeps His Word as well. And again, in the unity of theme and scope. Uh, the, obviously, the New Testament is very different than the Old Testament. Uh, much less narrative. Some would say that the Gospels fit the narrative, and they certainly do, but it's all about one person. So, uh, from four different perspectives. Uh, but the unity of theme of the major doctrinal issues, and that's, that's a very interesting point. Uh, as we get into the different translations and the different families of manuscripts that translators draw from, uh, the unity of theme and uh, the consistency of doctrine. So, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these issues tonight. Fulfilled prophecy, uh, prophecy of fo focusing mainly on the person of Jesus Christ, uh, and all the prophecies that were fulfilled in his life, and uh, that he, he even foretold himself about his own death and resurrection. Uh, certainly the person of Jesus Christ, you probably have all heard of, uh, I think it's Josh McDowell. Yeah, Josh McDowell. Um, by our lunatic or Lord argument that, uh, you know, you, you can call Jesus Christ a liar, which means that he intentionally deceived people. You can call him a lunatic and that he actually believed what he said, but he was, you know, on, in the same category as a person who thinks they're a cabbage. Or he's your Lord, but you can't call him the greatest moral teacher that ever lived because he doesn't leave that option out there. I am God. He said it many times, demonstrated it. And so, in terms of the person of Jesus Christ, he declares that he is God, he demonstrates that he's God, he fulfills all the prophecies of God in the Old Testament. So, to say that he's a great moral teacher is not even on the table. He's either a liar and he knows it, therefore, one of the most evil men that ever lived pretty difficult to come to that conclusion. He's totally nuts because he believed so much in what he was saying that he died for it. <coughs> that is truly a definition of insanity, that you would die for a lie. Or he is who he said he is. He's the Lord. And he is the Lord. So the person of Jesus Christ is a strong internal proof for the authenticity of the New Testament. And then, of course, enduring Christian doctrine. Enduring Christian doctrine. Uh, hope you get your Bibles with you. Turn to the book of Jude. Right next to Revelation. Yeah. Next to the last book. He's ready. I know where four of them are. In the book of Jude. Jude makes an interesting statement if you if you're at all familiar with the book and um, as uh, I think we have Old Testament survey, is that next? Yeah. So, um, in, in the course of these seven core courses, you will have an in-depth study of both the Old Testament, that's the next semester, of the, the books, and then uh, later the New Testament. And in the New Testament, we'll go much more into the books. But uh, Jude starts out to write about one thing, but then he changes because of he's concerned about false teaching. But look at verse 3. Jude 3. Karen, would you read that, please? Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write to and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Look at the, that last descriptor of the faith. What kind of faith was it? It was the faith that was once for all delivered to the church, the saints. All right? It, the, the doctrines are enduring, and they haven't changed since the first days of the church that we would date generally with the, the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The doctrines that were established by the apostolic writers have not changed. And one of the, one of the ways that you can know that you're running into any kind of false teaching is if someone says, I have a new teaching. I have a new doctrine, central tenet of the Christian faith that no one ever knew about before. That's a false doctrine. That's false teaching because the, the doctrines that uh, we find in the New Testament 
as Jude says, once for all delivered. They're not changing. They're not in the process of becoming something else and discovering new truths about them. We hold as central to our belief in Jesus Christ, the person and work of the Savior, exactly what the saints of the first century held as those core doctrines that are non-negotiable. That doesn't change. And that's what we would expect of a God who doesn't change. That when he lays down the most central tenets of, of our belief system, that those beliefs would be consistent through all times, generations, cultures, and peoples. So we find that. And that is a strong internal proof uh, across many different writers of the New Testament for uh, its authenticity. Um, under external proofs. You, okay, there you go. You got them all. All right. So external proofs. This would be outside of the book itself. What else was going on, uh, either contemporaneously at the same time as the writers of the New Testament were being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what we have in our Bibles, or in in the first years, the first couple centuries afterwards. Well, what proof can we bring to this book is what it claims to be? Well. It's pretty, you know, I don't know. I, I used to think the issue of martyrs was a pretty strong argument. And then Islam showed up. And, uh... You put a different meaning. It, do, it does. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, everybody? You know, I mean, the, the people would die for a lie. But then there's two sides of martyrdom. Some were martyred, and Paul for a long time wasn't. John. And John. And, and, because and, of the, his faith. Yeah. And, and uh... But, uh, you know, uh, I mean, hundreds of, of uh, followers of Jesus that uh, willingly, might even say gladly, went through unbelievable experiences for the cause of Jesus Christ. But not suicidal. Not suicidal. Not suicidal. They not weren't suicidal. taking other people out. They That's right. Them. They weren't killing other people in the name of their God. But when people said, renounce Jesus Christ or die, that wasn't even a choice for them. And I, you know, I sometimes think about that for myself. And I don't know if you've ever thought about that. To this point, 2012, in this nation, that is not a decision that we have to face. But I'm not kidding myself that hopefully not for my children, but very possibly for my grandchildren, that might be a, uh, something they would have to face. There's a, yeah, anyway. Um, but many did. And, uh, well, Yes, I also think the difference you're talking about uh, Islamic is that they actually seek martyrdom. Yeah, they, they, I don't believe that any of the Christians actually wanted to die mm -hmm. due to this. Okay, it doesn't. From what I can read, it, I just don't see how that's. Part of it. There are no stories of where they went down and volunteered. Uh -huh. All the stories are that somebody came and knocked the door down and came and died. Okay. That's right. And, but I mean, there's terrible stories, absolutely terrible stories of what happened to Christians. Um, under uh, Nero, when the persecutions began in Rome, I read a story, as far as I know, it's a true account, where uh, rich Roman senators would have villas out in the country, and they would, uh, they would uh, take Christians who were still alive, and they would impale them on posts and cover them with tar and light them. as like tiki lanterns or something to show sure, people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just the terrible things that people did that suffered for their faith um, because they were convinced that Jesus is who he said he was and they weren't going to deny him. And, and you know, I, I don't know how if you've ever actually addressed in your own heart if someone walked in that door right now and said, uh, you know, two guys with, with semi automatics and they said, line up against that wall if you claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And we're going to shoot you. Line up against this wall if you have any doubts or you want to reconsider. Just if you would, if you're certain which wall you would step against. These folks were certain. I would hope that we would have that same commitment to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And the one terrible thing is the idea that people like us died by people who claimed to be the church. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very sad. 
uh, historical corroboration. There are non-biblical writers, Josephus being prominent among them, who uh, refers to events that are in the scriptures and no discrepancy. Historically, the things that we have found independent sources to address or have mentioned, it, it corroborates what's in the scriptures. So again, uh, an external proof. Early church fathers, uh, there's, a, there's a significant body of work. Early church fathers, depending on, on you know, how far you think that goes, how many centuries, but at least probably to the fourth century, if not beyond. The, 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 late, the leaders of the church and um, their witness to, uh, from a very early period on, and we'll talk about this in a minute, uh, as to the validity of the, of the scriptures, while, you know, presumably they either had access to the originals or very early copies that were faithful, and their witness to that. And then finally, and, and this is what we'll spend some time with a little later, is the method of transmission. We saw a different method in the Old Testament because it, was, it really basically came about uh, about the same time as writing as a form of communication came about. But clearly, um, much later, uh, at the time of Christ, uh, how can we know that what we hold today has been faithfully transmitted over the centuries? We don't have a, uh, a, a Dead Sea Scrolls kind of a benchmark that we can refer to on the New Testament uh, manuscripts, but we will look at some other issues that relate to that. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> New Testament canon. Go ahead. Oh, oops, it's going to jump back. Okay. Um, so the canon again. Word means. Standard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Measuring rod or or a standard, if you will, that which came to be uh, recognized as as the uh, the inspired books of the New Testament by the close first century. All the New Testament books were in circulation amongst the churches. They had not been collected into a form that we would uh, recognize today. That actually took some time, but they all existed. The last book written was probably uh, the books of John. Uh, um, and those were Greek? In Greek or not yes. Latin yet? No, they were in Greek. Latin didn't come until the end of the, the fourth century. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, too. Um, obviously, because of the way they were passed around, all the books were available at every location. Um, nor was the canon put together. Uh, because not everybody had all 27 books, we can't say that every Christian from the first century on was reading what we know to be the New Testament. It just it didn't come together that way that quickly. Go ahead, Russ. So uh, Irenaeus, early church father of the second century, first used the term Old Testament and New Testament. We have him to thank for that. He quoted the four Gospels extensively, including quotations from all the New Testament books except Philemon and 3rd John. So, second century would be 100 to 199 AD. Very early on, uh, we had leaders in the church quoting and referencing what we know to be the New Testament books. He was in France. He was in France? Yeah, Lyon. Lyon? I must. No S? I'm, I'm, I'm taking your word for it here. I don't know. I don't speak French. That was partly a question, but the last four or five letters in the French word don't make much difference. Yeah. <laughs> you just mumble and you get it, right? Okay. The Muratorian canon at the close of the second century, so this would be by uh, 199 uh, AD, listed all the books present in the New Testament except for Hebrews, James, and the two epistles of Peter. You can see that, so it, in the one before that, which was. Um, uh, Leon, Leon uh, the, if, if you were to read the history of the canon of the New Testament, you would see that different, they didn't actually get them all together until, oh, get one more yeah. 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 so uh, the Third Council of Carthage, 397 AD, officially recognized uh, the New Testament canon of the 27 books that we have. There were several other uh, collections, canons, and there was not agreement about that for some time, and so if you were to read an early history of the canon of the New Testament, you would discover that the, the Miratory canon was uh, very well known, but as you could, it, it didn't have Hebrew, James, and, and, and Peter's two epistles, so it would have had 23 books, not 27. Uh, there was some other canons, uh, but uh, by the end of the, the fourth century, 397, the 27 books that we have today. Um, Hebrews, James, and the two 
Peter's had been written by a hundred years by now. Yeah, right. They just didn't have them. Well, they 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 had them and they didn't like them. They had them and they didn't like them. We're, we'll talk about that next. Okay. Um, so this is this is the basis for canonical recognition. Remember, it was there wasn't a committee vote on what is inspired or not, but they had certain criteria that had to be met. And the first one was apostolic. And three issues of, of apostolic criteria that you see there. It either had to be written by one of the twelve apostles, that would apply to some of the books in the New Testament, not all of them. It had to have been written at the direction of one of the twelve, in other words, authorized, uh, either dictated or uh, commissioned. Commission, same kind of thing, or uh, approved by the apostles, included uh, and receiving their stamp of approval. So there's that apostolic uh, part of the canonic, canonical books in the New Testament. But outside of the apostolic kind of you know stamp of approval of authenticity, there was there was the Christian community, and that's so that's the second issue that you have must have been accepted from the beginning by the Church of Scripture. Uh, again, it wasn't a vote. It, it was more of a recognition of what, what is the Holy Spirit telling the followers of Jesus is actually authentically the Word of God. Now, that sounds pretty loose, but that it actually worked. And that's, that's the process that we have. Books did not gradually attain the status of Scripture. Um, uh, there were a lot of non-canonical writings. So think for, we talked about that. And, and frankly, at this time, what we, as we discussed earlier, the books of the Apocrypha also were not determined at this time to be canonical. That came much later at the Council of Trent. And so the 27 books were acknowledged to uh, from early on as the, but because they didn't all be collected in one place at one time, it took some time for all of the manuscripts to basically make their way around the, the various centers of Christianity uh, to, and that's why it seems to have taken several hundred years to come together as a canon. So they were, they were in possession of, by other churches yeah. and other countries. They all existed, yeah. but they weren't all in one place in every town or, or church. But the canon was closed after the first century because conditions, especially the apostolic conditions, couldn't be met after that. So we have no books written after the close of 100 A.D. Uh, the book of Revelation and uh, the books of 1st, uh, 2nd, and 3rd John are thought to be the last books written toward the end of the first century. Questions about the, the canonicity of the New Testament? It, it is, I, I will be the first to say, it is not a straightforward series of connecting the dots. If you were to read some early histories of how did we end up with the 27 books that we have, you would hear this group over in Alexandria accepted these books, and this group over, you know, in uh, the far Antioch area, they accepted a different group, and it took a while for that to all come together. It was not a very clear, ah, we all got it, we all agree, let's move on. It did take some time for that to happen. But these criteria were the criteria that, that, that uh, eventually came together to form the canon that we have today. And had really since the first century, it just took time for that to all come together. No internet, no phone lines, travel was difficult. It took a while for uh, the manuscripts to travel all the way around. Well, having enough copies. Yeah, the copies. Copy yeah. Of it. yeah. Again, no printing presses. And so the whole manuscript duplication process was pretty. Uh, and that's the next thing. Go ahead, why don't you go to that? So this is a, a textual transmission. Uh, the, <coughs> There's a whole field of academic study, uh, if you were, if you have the interest, and uh, some do, to go into uh, how do we know what is the authentic, 
the, the real deal of what the Gospel of Mark should be, or you know, Paul's uh, letter to the Ephesians. And there's a whole field of study, uh, academic study, called textual transmission, uh, textual criticism, that deals with how do you know uh, what is the closest to the original. But in terms of the, the actual physical transmission of the text, obviously starts out before the, the invention of the printing press and copying manuscripts. We know what the sulfurine are, the counters, the, uh, the, the scribes, if you, that they later came to be called, that uh, recorded uh, not only the scriptures, but uh, reports of the kings and rulers of that day. And then, of course, in, in the, the manuscript process, one of the things that's fascinating to me, let, let me just, okay, so I've got the only copy here of First John, and I read it to you. And as I read the first line of 1 John, you all write it down. All right? So there's, say there's, there's 15 copies being written of 1 John. Uh, but because of weather and fires and everything you can imagine, only one of these 15 copies actually survives in 25 years. For whatever reason, the other 14 copies don't survive. But on that one copy that did survive, when I read the first line of, of 1 John, uh, it, I'll just pick on the mark here. <laughs> Did you look like me? And I did think about honey. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's the first line of 1 John. What was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld in our hands handled concerning the word of life. That's the first verse, okay? Yeah. They wouldn't have done it by verses because they didn't have verse numbers for several hundred years. But just take that first line. And, and in that room that day, Mark's still thinking about the outfit he missed. And when I said, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, he's all me thinking, yeah, no, I, had, I had it right there. Yeah, it really I could have shot it. You know? and, and, and now he's thinking about that. And he misses the line, what we have seen with our eyes, and then he goes, oh, what we beheld in our hands, how it concerning the word of life. But his is the only copy that survived. But it wasn't exactly. So what you find in, in the field of uh, textual criticism is how, how do they discover what of all the manuscripts, and there's thousands of them, uh, partial and complete manuscripts of various books of the New Testament, how do you figure out which is the one that is closest to the original document? And it is a fascinating way how they, how they, how they go through that. But, uh, and so those manuscripts tended to collect in various centers of Christianity in the first, second, and third century. And we will talk about that a little bit, how there are families of manuscripts, and those determine the translations that we have today. Those families of manuscripts and what still survives. Hey, Rob. Yeah. Is there the same skepticism <laughs> of other documents around the same time period, of historical records, of the yeah. and genealogies? You know, that's a, that's a good question. Because if you were to take any other ancient writing, pick any one that you Aristotle. want to. Aristotle. Aristotle. Or the, the history of the Roman. Yeah, anything. Where the writings survived? There, there is almost nothing. There is almost nothing that survived. And often, we hope that there's the original that's still in our hands, but there's so few copies left, or the, or the oldest copy is, you know, from 1100 AD, purported to be a copy of a copy of a copy, but that's the only one that exists up until the time of the printing press. But the, 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 the number of manuscripts that exist for the New Testament is just, if you, you were to put it next to the, the most documented ancient work of the same time period, this would be the Empire State Building, and that would be a pebble. I mean, that's the difference in how much manuscript evidence we have for the New Testament compared to any other ancient writing. And, and so it's overwhelming what God has preserved compared to anything else. And so, yeah, it, what, what's interesting, and that's why uh, I, your question is that there t tends to be a different standard applied to the Word of God than there is to almost anything else, you know? We just assume that well, Homer wrote that. But we don't know if Homer wrote that. We don't really have any good copies. We don't know if that's all that he wrote, if there's big chunks missing, but everyone just assumes that's what Homer wrote. So.
got got a little more a little more careful. So obviously, uh, you know, why didn't we destroy Mark's mistake? Yeah, well, we will get to that. Okay, I'm not putting your question off. When we get to the families of manuscripts and how, why that's in King James, but it's it's a footnote in almost every other translation. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But yes, there were mistakes. Um, and because of the process, you know, it, it, it just, uh, it just uh, the way the manuscript copying happened. Uh, not, it wasn't always in a room with one person reading and everyone else writing. Sometimes it was just one person by candle. But the same kind of errors could happen. What's interesting is that we don't have the evidence, as far as we know, that uh, the, the numbering of letters and the, and the, the, the mathematical uh, computations that went into the preservation of the Old Testament, we don't have a parallel kind of story about that happening with the New Testament. But we have many, many, many more manuscripts to draw from. But again, we still have the challenge of how do we know which one of these, you know, 1,200 manuscripts all, you know, claiming to be 1 John, which one is authentic? And so that whole, uh, it's an art really more than a science, and we'll talk about some of that. So uh, obviously, before the press, any, any manuscript, very rare, very costly. People, you know, there was cost involved. So there wasn't a wide distribution of, I mean, the, the printing press changed Christianity. If you can imagine that if you lived in a country like America, and there was 10,000 Bibles in the entire country, with the, what are we at? But that's it. Yeah, and that's all we have. And, and, and how rare those are. And, and for centuries, they tended to be in the hands of, of the church leadership and not in the average citizen. So all of that was, uh, to me, that, that, that God would preserve his word and have it faithfully transmitted through before the press came on. So the Gutenberg Bible was the first major book produced in the, by a printing press anywhere in the world. And it uh, happened during the, about the, the 1450s is the nearest that they can uh, date it. Interestingly enough, the Gutenberg Bible is a, uh, it's a printed version of the Latin Vulgate. It's not a printed version of the original Greek manuscripts. It's a printed version of what was then the, the Catholic Bible. So it's the Latin Vulgate. Um, Obviously, all-time bestseller. I, I read a statistic, and this statistic was some years old, but the statistic that I read, and I think it was from early on uh, after 2000, is that it's estimated conservatively that every day in the world, nine to 10,000 Bibles are printed. Every day around the world, nine to 10,000 Bibles are printed. That so far outsurpasses anything else that has been printed today or in all of history since the invention of the printing press that it, it is, there are millions and millions of Bible and continue at the rate of 10,000 a day to be printed in various languages. Um, and the, the reference there to Voltaire's house, there was a, uh, it's, it's, Voltaire was a, uh, he lived from 1694 to 1778. <clears throat> he was a so-called enlightenment figure. Yeah, I won't ever ask you this in a test, but it's one of those obscure things. Uh, Voltaire uh, rejected the uh, authority of the Bible, uh, and he made a claim, and it became a very famous claim. He claimed that he'd make the Bible nothing more than a museum piece within a hundred years. And the story, like the Voltaire's house here, the story is that a hundred years after Voltaire's death, his house was being used to print and store Bibles. <laughs> I, you know, there's some some dispute as to whether or not that's really true, but it does make a great point. <clears throat> Voltaire, how many people know Voltaire's name? And uh, how many people know the Bible, whether they follow it as their guide for life or not? So that's the reference to Voltaire. That's so early on in the history. Um, <clears throat> at this point, before we get into what you have on your overhead, I'm going to give you a fairly long thing that... Uh, Yeah. Is that the right thing? 
Would it be helpful if we punched holes in them? Oh, yeah. Is um, that, would it be helpful uh, or are you doing that on our own? Oh, no one put in the extra. Yeah, it's harder. It's easier to put holes in than take them out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, if, if the two terms at the top, if you're not familiar with them, uh, I'm going to go through this article because this article really, uh, we're going to cover some of this in a broader scope, but I, I, I run into the issue of translations often enough as a pastor that I was looking around and I found this article and this guy's right on, so I wanted to bring in your attention to this. So Westcott and Hort, at the, 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 the title here, Westcott and Hort is sometimes referred to as the majority text, although that's a misnomer. We'll, we'll see why as we get along. And Textus Receptus, you'll see what that means, but that is the source uh, manuscripts for the King James Bible. So if you see Textus Receptus, that is the source manuscript for uh, King James. Oh, Westcott Hort is, came along a couple hundred years later and uh, from a different family of manuscripts and um, and we'll go. All right, I'm just going to read through here. I'll make a few comments uh, starting. Just follow along with me. New Testament was inspired by God. It came from the pens of its writers or their amanuenses. Anyone familiar with that? That is a secretary. That is a, that is a modern scribe. That's a person who uh, you dictate what God said to you and someone writes it down, which has actually probably happened to the majority of the New Testament books. Paul's books were probably not actually pinned by Paul. They were pinned by the Monuments. I don't know why they don't just say secretary. But. Okay. <laughs> so they were in their infallible form, free from any defect of any sort, including scribal mistakes. The original manuscript, okay? However, God has promised did not choose to protect that infallible original text from alterations and corruptions in the copying and printing process. Scribes and printers made both accidental, usually, and deliberate, sometimes intentional, changes in the Greek text as they copied it. As a result, the surviving manuscript copies of the New Testament differ among themselves in numerous details. Many attempts have been made, even as early as the second century AD, to sort through the manuscripts of the New Testament and weed out the errors and mistakes of copyists in order to restore the text to its original apostolic form. Those who have made such attempts have differed one from another in the resources at their disposal their own personal ability as text editors, and the principles followed in trying to restore the original text of the New Testament. The two most famous attempts at restoring the original text of the New Testament are the Textus Receptus, dating from the Re Reformation and post-Reformation era, and the Greek text of Westcott and Hort, first published in 1881. So we have about 200 years, almost 300 years between those two. These two texts were based on differing collections of manuscripts following differing textual principles at different stages in the ongoing process of the discovery and evaluation of surviving New Testament manuscripts, and not surprisingly, with very different results. There's much dispute today about which of these texts is a more faithful representation of the original form of the Greek New Testament. This is a question that this uh, study is going to take up. Okay. Next paragraph. Any proper and adequate answer to this question must begin with a matter of definition of terms. First, what does it mean by the term superior? This may seem an unnecessary question since it might be supposed that all would agree on the answer, namely, the superior Greek New Testament is that one which mostly closely preserves and presents the precise original word wording of the original Greek writings of the New Testament. However, in the rather voluminous popular literature on this issue, some writers have argued that one text or another is superior because it is perceived to contain more proof texts on certain doctrinal issues, such as the Trinity or the deity of Christ or some other doctrine. In fact, to make a selection on such a basis is much beside the point. Additional supporting proof texts of numerous doctrines can be found in various Greek manuscripts or versions, though the readings are beyond dispute, not the original reading of the New Testament. In other words, what what the uh, author is saying is that if you want to just support your favorite doctrines or your favorite grouping of doctrines, you can find plenty of support in other material written by early church fathers and early theologians. You don't have to intentionally draw from a manuscript that we're almost certain wasn't part of the original manuscript just for support for your doctrine. That's his argument. Okay, Textus Receptus. 
What does it mean by the term received text? That's the English translation of text history substance. This name was first applied to a printed Greek text as late as 1633, or almost 120 years after the first published Greek New Testament appeared in 1516. In 1633, These people published the second edition of their Greek text, and that text contained the publisher's blurb. And that's Latin, but you can see that in that, which means therefore you have the text now received by all, there's where we get the term textus receptus. All right? Or received text was taken and applied collectively and retroactively to the series of published Greek New Testaments extending from 1516 to 1633. It wasn't just one document. It was a series of documents over 120 years. Most notable among the many editors of the Greek New Testaments in this period were Erasmus. Most people would say Erasmus was the Dutch scholar who was tasked to originally come up with the, the manuscripts that form the basis for the King James Bible. But as you're going to see, there was more than Erasmus here. Another man named uh, Robert Estien, a.k.a. Robertus Stephanus, uh, Theodore de Beza, and Elzevirs, uh, many editions. These many Greek texts display a rather close general uniformity, a uniformity based on the fact that all these texts are more or less reprints of the text edited by Erasmus. That's why Erasmus is often cited as being the author of the King James, with only minor variations. These texts were not independently compiled by the many different editors on the basis of close personal examination of numerous Greek manuscripts, but are genealogically related. Proof of this is to be found in a number of unique readings in Erasmus's texts. That is, readings which are found in no known Greek manuscript, but which are nevertheless found in the editions of Erasmus. One of these is a reading in Revelation 22.19. Open your Bibles, if you would, so you can see where we're coming from. Revelation 22.19. You're going to learn more than you ever wanted to know about where the King James came from and where other modern translations came from. And, uh, I told you to go to Mark's. <laughs> okay, Revelation 22.19. Uh, Who's got a, an NIV here? Mark, would you read 2219? And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him the share of the tree of life and the holy city which you're described in this book. Okay, uh, look into your notes there. All known Greek manuscripts here read tree of life. Instead, book of life. Textus Receptus has the phrase book of life. Now you've got to follow the next section. When Erasmus was la compiling his text, he had access to only one manuscript of Revelation. Remember, this is the late 16th century, or early 16th century. So he took the Latin Vulgate and back-translated from Latin to Greek. Can you picture what happened here? Wait, he only he, had... No, it, it, it lacked the last six verses. It lacked the last six verses. So he has one copy of the book of Revelation in Greek, but it didn't have the last six verses from... from 17 on. So the only thing that he had was the Latin Vulgate, which was a 4th century Latin translation of Greek manuscripts. So he takes his Latin translation and he translates it back into Greek, and that's how he comes with, up with the last six verses of the book of Revelation that you find in Textus Receptus. Right? Didn't have an original manuscript in the Greek. So he took the Latin Vulgate, back translated to Unfortunately, the copy of the Vulgate he used read Book of Life, unlike any Greek manuscript of the passage. And so Erasmus introduced a unique Greek reading in his text, in, in what we call Textus Receptus. Since the first and only source for this reading in Greek is the printed text of Erasmus, any Greek New Testament that agrees with Erasmus here must have been simply copied from his text, because it's original with him, because he back-translated from Latin to Greek, and that's how he came up with Book of Life instead of Tree of Life. And uh, <clears throat> so, the fact that all Texas Receptus editions, and names some others there, read with Erasmus, shows that their texts were more or less slavish reprints of Erasmus' text and not independently compiled editions.
For had they been independently edited of Erasmus, they would surely have followed the Greek manuscripts here and read Tree of Life, not Book of Life. Everybody follow the, the, the argument here? Okay. Numerous other unique and extremely rare readings in the Texas receptions could be referenced. Now, before we go further, let me just say this. I am not opposed to Texas Receptus. It is a good family of manuscripts. I would just say it's not the best. Okay, but we're gonna, when we get down to the end here, the bottom line is very interesting. So, last paragraph. In this connection, it's worth noting that the translators of the King James Version did not follow exclusively any single printed edition of the New Testament in Greek. The edition most closely, closely followed by them was Beza's edition of 1598. But they departed from that edition in the reading in some published Greek texts at least 170 times and at least in, in at least 60 places. The King James translators abandoned all then existing printed editions of the Greek New Testament, choosing instead to follow precisely the reading in the Latin Vulgate. Okay, so it's a translation of a translation of the original text. That's necessarily going to have some shades of meaning that probably are not as faithful to the original text. All right, go ahead. But they were under the divine guidance of the Holy Spirit. If, would you support that from Scripture for me? It's not in the Scripture. It's not in the Scripture. Well, yes, it is. The, the um, propagation of the Bible is for the best member, and I can't uh, reference it for you, but I'm begging you to remember the propagation of the Word of the Bible and the it has been preserved by the Holy Spirit from its original. Absolutely, I would agree with that. But to make the leap that the version the Holy Spirit faithfully preserved is the King James, I think, is not consistent with the facts. Then we have to say that micro examination of any version of the Bible is probably a waste of time. Let's keep reading. Because you bring up an excellent point. If we can't, we can't lay all of our eggs in one basket called Textus Receptus, what basket do we put our eggs in? We hatch a bunch of chickens and then get a yeah. egg. <laughs> okay. A good egg. Okay, top of the next page. No addition of the Greek New Testament agreed precisely with the text followed by the King James translators was in existence until 1881. And uh, when uh, Scrivener produced such an edition, though even it differs from the King James in a very few places, and then he cites uh, Acts 19.20. It is Scrivener's 1881 uh, text, which was reprinted by the Trinitarian Bible Society in 1976. This text does not conform exactly to any of the historic texts dating from the Reformation period and known collectively as Textus Receptus. Furthermore, a careful distinction must be made between Textus Receptus, even in its broadest collective sense on one hand, and the majority text. Okay, that's another phrase you may have heard. It, it's in your notes. The majority text, also known as the Byzantine or Syrian text on the other. Though the terms Tectus, Receptus, and majority text are frequently used as though they were synonymous, they by no means mean the same thing. When the majority text was being compiled by Hodges and Farstad, their collaborator, a man named Pickering, estimated that their resultant text would differ from Texas Receptus in a thousand places. In fact, the differences amounted to uh, 1838. In other words, the reading of the majority of Greek manuscripts differs from the Texas Receptus in 1838 places, and in many of these places, the text of Westcott and Hort uh, agrees with the majority of manuscripts against the Texas Receptus. The majority of manuscripts and Westcott and Hort agree the new, the, the Texas Receptus in excluding, and here's where you're going to run into it. So there's three citations, in, uh, and it makes reference to Revelation 22, 19. So let's just look at those three, because these are three areas that are noticeably different in the King James than any other family of translations. So the first one you have is Luke 17, 36. What, I'll cut to the chase here, just so you know where this is going to end up. On none of these issues where there are differences in manuscript families, collections of manuscripts that, from which a translation is made, is there's not one of them that bears on a significant doctrine. On the doctrinal issues, they are all in agreement. As you'll see from these three examples, they're very minor. So Luke 17, 36, um, some of your Bibles don't have Luke 17, 36. Well, you have brackets around it, right? Right. And it says at the bottom, something along, many MMSS do not contain this verse. 
All right? It is only in the Texas Receptus, but what you have is that, you know, Erasmus, he had access to so many manuscripts. He took those manuscripts, and that's where we got Texas Receptus. Um, he didn't have all the manuscripts. He, he didn't have, I mean, not, it's nothing like today. Uh, the printing press had just been invented. And uh, so, uh, but the manuscripts that he had access to, faithful on all the doctrinal issues. But we have uh, passages like 1736 that aren't in manuscripts older than the ones that Erasmus referenced. And if you just think about the process of uh, transmission, what would tend to be the more faithful manuscript? One that's 1000 AD or one that's 500 AD? 500. Probably the older manuscript. Probably. Well, it depends on the depends. methodology and the due right. diligence. It the depends issues. on a lot of other issues. But generally, the older the manuscript, the more faithful it probably is than the new ones. But just because of the process of transmission, the, the possibility of mistakes, scribal errors, scribal additions. Um, for instance, what you find when, uh, in, in textual criticism, if you come to a passage in the Gospels, and in one translation, uh, one group of old manuscripts, it says, and Jesus said to his disciples. And then you come to another family of manuscripts, and it says, and the Lord Jesus said to his disciples. And then you come to a third family of manuscripts from a different region, and it says, the Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples. Which one is faithful to the original? One of the, uh, and this is not, we're not going to spend much time here, but one of the rules in textual criticism, in other words, how do you get to what is the most faithful of the original manuscripts, generally says the shortest version is most likely the authentic version. Because what scribes tend to do, for clarity's sake, often for out of reverence, is they tend to expand. Well, it says Jesus, but wouldn't it be more honoring to Jesus to say the Lord Jesus Christ? It makes no difference at all, doctrinally. It makes no difference at all to the, to the, you know, the ground of our faith. But in terms of trying to determine what was probably the original manuscript, generally the shorter version is preferred over the longer version. Older languages were simpler. They were simpler. And, and scribes, more out of reverence than any other reason, tended to add rather than subtract. Wait a second. Older languages aren't necessarily simpler. Well, we'll talk about the Greek language in a bit. Okay. Uh, turn to Acts 8.37. It's the next reference you have there in your uh, document, Acts 8.37. Okay, you're, you're, well, we're at 837 is what we're turning. Here, for your reading. Middle of the, middle of the page on page 30. <laughs> uh, in that big, huge paragraph. Again, right some of your Bibles have 837 in parentheses. All right? Older manuscripts did not have verse 37. Is there anything doctrinally significant about verse 37? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's great stuff. But what if Luke never wrote it? Should we have it in our Bible, even though it's really good stuff? No. No. All right? So older manuscripts than the ones that, that Erasmus took to for Texas don't have uh, 837. And probably the most famous of all is mm -hmm. John 5. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. Um, when you say some Bibles may not have that verse at all, yeah. So what? Verse thirty-eight becomes thirty-seven. Yeah, they just don't have it. Just not verse thirty-nine. The, 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 no, no, the, 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 the verse numbers are not inspired. I understand that. You said some Bibles. I mean, I was thinking of modern yeah. Modern, 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 modern. Some modern translations just see what you mostly have is most of your Bibles will will re, will reproduce even the questionable areas of the Texas Receptus and just parentheses and say, older manuscripts do not have this verse. Right. And so we will put an asterisk and just say, no, then you'll follow what I'm saying. If that verse is needed from the Bible that you're reading, mm -hmm. so you have you a different number of verses. Yeah. Then 38 becomes 37. Right. Right. No. Well, 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 no. Normally what they'll do is they'll get 37 in there because it's in the King James and they just won't have it. It's the R of A, I mean, instead of having it. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's what what my, yeah, yeah, he doesn't have one. Excuse me. What does it say? What does Mark? yours say in the NIV? It, it, it won't even have it. It, it have skips it. skips the number, but then it'll have a footnote that will say that. The, and then it says it down there. It does it's skip the number? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It'll yeah. Skip so yeah. your Bible doesn't have an Acts 837. No. Okay. That was my question. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. Other questions? Yes. I understand what the King James is doing. But you know, it, it is it is a wonderful translation, and we haven't really got to the nitty gritty of the main uh, manuscript families yet. I'm just we're we're just kind of working through this article just to show where there are differences, and admittedly these are minor differences. The first John five seven passage is probably a little more significant difference. Um, again, as you you go there, the the more modern translations that generally work from older manuscripts than what was available to Erasmus in the early 16th century, don't have, I mean, and this, this, is, uh, this, this one is dated 1971. I don't even have the verse here. Um, but I do, I did bring a King James with me. And I've got it in here, so I can really read. use this. So what Bible did you say does not have? First John 5, 7. This, this is a NASB. It doesn't have it at all. Mine does. And, and, and many of our modern translations faithfully reprint, and then they put an asterisk. Well, what's interesting is that this is the one example given in here that does not have brackets or asterisks or anything else. It's just printed. It's just printed. Mine has a note on the bottom. And mine does um, um, and so this is uh, a uh, three that bear record in heaven. Mm -hmm. in heaven. The three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And eight, there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. All right? Older manuscripts, read, it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is the truth. That's very different than seven and eight. Really? Very different. <laughs> Okay, that's probably the most significant difference uh, in terms of, of, of statement. All right? Um, this New King James, you could never tell if there's anything wrong. Huh. Keeps finding you know what, what's interesting is that uh, in some of the... How old is that New King James? Yeah, but this, this one um, 20 years. 20 years. Oh, okay. If you were to pick up uh, a New King James written in the last few years, they, they actually have gone back and they have actually done some bracketing and asterisks on some of these passages um, that we we pulled out here as well. So, um, okay. again, not significantly important for our core doctrines. Because there are other scriptures yeah. that do teach that doctrine. Okay, so I'm down at the, at the paragraph that starts, the question remains, okay, on your, on your uh, article. Question remains a result. How shall we define Texas Receptus? It's been customary in England to employ the 1550 text of Stephanus as the exemplar of the Texas Receptus. And you can read the parentheses. And so we'll follow this custom. For our purposes here, the term Texas Receptus, although you can see from this discussion, it's not one copy. It is a series of copies over 120 years of manuscripts. Um, so the 1550 edition of the Greek New Testament published by uh, Robertus Stephanus. The Westcott and Hort text came along in 1881, much simpler to define. This is the Greek New Testament edited by those two fellas, with numerous reprints in the century since. It's probably the single most famous of the so-called critical texts, perhaps because of the scholarly eminence of its editors, perhaps because it was issued the same year as the English Revised Version, which followed the text much like the Westcott uh, Hort. I am not going to read the next couple paragraphs. Um, Please feel free to do so at your leisure. If you turn over to the next page, page four, a paragraph that starts, though the Westcott Hort text was the standard critical text for a generation or two, it is no longer considered such by anyone and has not been for many years, the standard text, okay? The standard text or text today are the Nestle or Nestle Allen text, and it goes through a bunch of editions, uh, published by United Bible Society. The last two editions of each of these uh, sport an identical text, a new, so to speak, received text. It is true the Westcott Test Horse is part of the heritage of both the Nestle text and the UBS, United Bible Society text, 
Eberhard Nestle originally used as his text the consensus reading of three editions of the Greek New Testament in his day. He, he cites them there. The UBS editors used Westcott Hort as their starting point and departed from it as their evaluation manuscript evidence required. None of the major modern English Bible translations made since World War II used Westcott Hort as its base. This includes translations done by theological conservatives, and these would be the New American Standard Bible, the New International Bible, or, and the New King James Version, for example. Translations done by theological liberals, and in that group would be Revised Standard Version, New English Bible, and the Good News Bible. The only English Bible translation currently in print that the writer is aware of, which is based on Westcott Hort, is the New World Translation of the JW. Interesting how things change over time. <laughs> yeah. Is Nestle the NAS? Pardon? Is Nestle the NAS? Uh, the, the NAS, right. I, you know, I meant to bring my uh, current Greek New Testament, which is the 27th edition um, of the Nestle All in Text, and um, I, did, I will bring it next time. It's all in Greek, but it cites every manuscript that documents every verse in the whole thing and you can see where they came from. Go ahead. Uh, so you have a New Testament you read mm -hmm. with its references. Yeah, and it, it breaks down every verse where there's a question and there's many of them and it tells you all these manuscripts say this thing, all these manuscripts say this, all these manuscripts say that. Yeah, no wonder you're hard to argue with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in a very real sense, that's the second from the last paragraph. In a very real sense, the great question of which is superior between the two, Westcott and Hort text, is passé since neither is recognized by experts in the field as the standard text. However, since modern printed Greek texts are in the same respective families of texts, and here we get to the families, namely the Alexandrian family, which is the Nestle group, or the Byzantine family, which is, tends to be more the Texas Receptus group, it is suitable to ask which one is superior, that is, which comes closest to presenting the Greek text in the form that the authors first wrote it. All right, that's what we're trying to find out. The, the Alexandrian is, a, is Alexandria of, uh, of Egypt. Egypt. Yes. Yeah. And Byzantine is uh, Turkey. 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 Right. Those are the two major families. There are other families of texts, but those are the two major ones. All right. Mm -hmm. What is perhaps, in the last paragraph, for the strongest argument in favor of Westcott Park text, you know, as compared to the Texas Receptus, is the fact that it has firm support from the oldest existing Greek manuscripts, plus the earliest versions of translations, as well as the early Christian writers of the second through fourth centuries. Age of manuscripts is probably the most objective factor in the process of textual criticism in determining which is the most faithful to the original. When Westcott and Hort compiled their text, they employed the two oldest then known manuscripts. These are words you might run into. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus as their text base. Since their day, a good number of manuscripts is old, and in some cases, a century more older than these two manuscripts have been discovered. In other words, archaeological finds discover even older texts. So Erasmus used what he had, but in the 500 years since then, there have been many archaeological discoveries of texts older than what he had access to. So, with a general uniformity, these early manuscripts have supported the Alexandrian text type which the Westcott Hort text presents. It is true that these papyrus manuscripts occasionally contain Byzantine type readings, but none of them could in any way be legitimately described as being regularly Byzantine, or in other words, uh, as a source for Texas Receptus. The agreement of some of the papyri, which Vaticanus especially, uh, has been quite remarkable. Um, I'm going to go a little further, okay? This is a hot button, right? We really only have one brave soldier here, you know, taking a stand for, for King James. But I want to uh, encourage you in that. I think it's a valid discussion. I don't think it undermines the authority of Scripture. I don't think that, that it calls into question that this is God's Word. But because it does tend to divide people in churches, I think it is an issue we should address. I think that's... Okay, so um, and, and that's what driving me. Yeah. I'm seeing all wrong the last bunch that <laughs> instructed me more. Okay, all right. So I'm at the top of page five. You have that in the top right corner. 
Of the early versions, Westcott Horn text has strong support in the various Coptic versions of the 3rd and later centuries, plus frequent support in the old Latin versions, the oldest forms of the Syriac, which is, was an Aramaic translation of the New Testament in 150 AD. In particular, the Sinaitic uh, and Curatonian manuscripts whose text forms date to the 2nd or 3rd century. Uh, Jerome's version of the Old Latin, we call it the Vulgate, made approximately 400 AD, also gives support. Interestingly enough, the Latin Vulgate was probably drawn from the Alexandrian family of texts. Of early Christian writers before the 4th century, the Alexandrian text has substantial support, especially in the writings of Oregon, whose scripture quotations are exceedingly numerous. On the other hand, the Byzantine text type, of which Textus Receptus is a rough approximation, can boast of being presented in the vast majority of the manuscripts that survive later, as well as several important verses in the New Testament from the 4th century or later. So what we have, if you were to take all of the manuscripts that exist today, that we have access today through museums, in, in university libraries, wherever they might be, if you were to take in, in a number in the eight to 10,000s of portions or whole books, if you were to take that vast group of manuscripts, what you would find is most of them date obviously later than earlier. That would make sense, right? The older something is, the more likely that we've lost it or it's been destroyed because it was papyrus on, on the earliest version. It's not a, not a very durable writing instrument. And, but you would find that most of, from about 1000 AD on, reflect uh, manuscripts from the Byzantine family. And most of the older manuscripts reflect uh, manuscripts from the Alexandrian family. All right? But we have many more Byzantine, because there are many more that still exist today in museums and university libraries than we do in, in that other family. And, and when I say that, they didn't all come from one place, but it tended to be those were very large libraries, ancient libraries, that, that actually spent some effort preserving old texts. And so where we have found those through archaeological digs, we tend to group them together when they tend to reflect the same source material. So that's why we've kind of boiled it down to basically two groups here. Okay. Break time. Break time. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to start on the downside. Let's let's take a break. Oh, what? This, this is this is. I think this guy's pretty fair-minded. I'm on the downside, middle of page five. On the downside, the distinctively Alexandrian text. Okay, that's the older series of manuscripts uh, that more modern translations are based on. All but disappears after the ninth century. Remember how I said that there's hardly any surviving manuscripts after the 9th century. On the other hand, the Byzantine manuscripts, the basis for Textus Receptus, though very numerous, did not become the majority text until the 9th century. And though outnumbering Alexandrian manuscripts by more than 10 to 1 are also much later in time, most being a thousand years and more removed from the original. So while we have many more from the Byzantine family manuscripts, they're a thousand years newer. All right? Returning to the specific texts, Westcott Hort versus Texas, in truth, both texts necessarily fall short of presenting the true original. Obviously, those readings in the Texas Receptus, which are without any Greek manuscript support, cannot possibly be original. Well, that's maybe obvious to him, maybe not so obvious to other people. Additionally, in a number of places, the Texas Receptus reading is found in a limited number of late manuscripts with little or no support from ancient translations. One of these that we looked at earlier was 1 John 5 7. And if one holds to the nose count theory of textual criticism, that is, where whatever the reading found in a numerical majority of surviving Greek manuscripts must be the original, then the Texas Receptus, if you count all the manuscripts together, falls short in 1800 plus readings. And here's the one that gets me, though, the, fast, the bottom paragraph. Besides these shortcomings in Textus Receptus, others in Textus Receptus, I'm, I'm adding those two words in there so you know what they're discussing here, also apparently occur in a number of places where a perceived difficulty in original reading was altered by scribes in the manuscript copying process. Probable examples of this include, turn to Mark 1. 
you need to see how sometimes the scribes, in an effort probably to be helpful, did not faithfully preserve the original. Mark 1. We would just run right over this. Mark 1, 2. First line reads in... What, who, anybody? Go ahead. How does it read, Thomas? As it is written in the prophets. Okay. In all the rest of your Bibles, how does that first line read? Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Uh, the oldest manuscripts have Isaiah the prophet. Only more recent manuscripts, dating from about the 9th century on, have the prophets. Why? If you look at the quotes in verses 2 and 3, it's not the, exact phrasing. Well, it's not only, not only that, verse 2 is from Malachi. <laughs> so the scribe was actually correct in making a slight change, but that's maybe not be what the original actually said. Okay? Uh, another example. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6. I'm at the bottom of this page, and I'm just looking at his examples. And just so you can see, these are where the scribes sometimes change things to clarify. But that doesn't mean that that's what it was in the original manuscript. Um, come with the NIV, read verse 20. Uh, Mark, you got it. 6 one of that. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. Okay. Uh, so, does every, anybody have anything different than that other than NASB is pretty much the same, but a couple words. Okay. I have uh, your body with a price, therefore glorify God with your body and with your spirit, which are God's. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. See that last phrase, that, that reflects a difference between Texas Receptus, the, the, uh, the Byzantine family, versus the, the, the more ancient manuscripts of, again, uh, if you recall what I said earlier, scribal editions tend to extend. They tend to add things for clarity purposes. But is that what the author actually, the original text, said? And the effort is to get at what the, the but the, probably the most egregious of all of these, this reflects Catholic doctrine. Uh, right there at the bottom, Luke 2.33. So if you will turn to Luke 2, 33. This is where you see the Catholic dogma influence in particular here. So Luke 2, 33. Um, Sean, go ahead and read verse 33 if you were there. Luke 2, 33. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. Okay. That's pretty straightforward. Right? His father and mother were amazed at the things being said. Um, but, Thomas, if you would. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Yeah. Okay. Now look at your note at the very bottom of, the, of page 5. Luke 2, 33, changing his father and his mother into Joseph and his mother to safeguard the doctrine of the virgin birth. And there are some other ones. Uh, here's one. Well, I'll go with one more. Okay, I'm yeah, on right top page six. Turn to Romans 13 9. Romans 13 9. Toward the end of the book of Romans. So, Paul, Paul is the author of Romans. And the 13 9. This is an argument, uh, and it's basically teaching on, uh, you know, how how the follower of Jesus Christ is to submit to government institutions. Um, verse thirteen, verse nine, and thirteen, uh, in the second half of the Decalogue. Okay, fancy word for the Ten Commandments. In the second half of the Decalogue, what commandment is missing? It won't be missing in Thomas's version, but it's missing in all of your other translations. In verse 9, which one is not there of the second half of the Ten Commandments? No, 
That's, that's the first half. Okay? Second half? Tone five and then two one. Okay? You guys, you guys, this is dust on how you know you take commandments. <laughs> Go ahead and read it, Thomas. Yes. And everyone compare your verse 9 to what he's going to read. The whole power means the whole thing. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall, shall not bear fed for that false witness, and you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, they are all signed, uh, summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The oldest manuscripts do not have to not buy false witness. But for the sake of completion, perhaps Paul just forgot. Well, I'll be there. But what is the original? <clears throat> the, argue, the, the, the intent is, how do we discover what the original manuscript was, not what the scribal thought would be helpful for people later reading his particular copy? And so that's that's so what you get there is a little bit of insight into how the the whole science or art, if you will, of determining the most faithful to the original manuscript is done, and how we tend to get some things added over time. Um, so, go ahead. What's in the original one? It doesn't have bare false witness. It isn't there. It's not there. Does it change? It doesn't change anything, right? It covers it with, and if there's any other command. And if there's any other command, it doesn't, but they weren't all listed from thou shalt not murder down. If, if you skip thou shalt not bear false witness, you skip one. It doesn't change the significance nor the meaning or the understanding of the text. But for the sake of completion, it was added in in later manuscripts, but not in earlier but manuscripts. There, but to extend that, the admonition not to bear false witness is included in the Old Testament. Absolutely. No argument. But was it included in Paul's original manuscript of Romans 13, 9? I'm going to change the way I look at this book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the bottom line. What shall we say then? All right, I'm middle paragraph on page 6. Which text shall we choose as superior? We shall choose, here's this conclusion, this should satisfy everybody. We shall choose neither the Westcott text or its modern kinsman, nor the Texas Receptus or the majority of Texas, some call it, as our standard text as our text of last appeal. All these printed texts are compiled or edited texts formed on the basis of the informed or not so well informed opinions of fallible editors. Neither Erasmus nor Westcott and Hort, nor need we say any other text editor or group of editors is omniscient or perfect in reasoning and judgment. All right? But the bottom line, jump down to the, the next paragraph. We do or should do this very thing in reading commentaries and theology books. We hear the evidence, we consider the arguments, we weigh the options, and then we arrive at what we believe to be the honest truth. Can one be faulted for doing the same regarding the variants in the Greek New Testament? Our aim is to know precisely what the apostles originally did write. This and nothing more. This and nothing less. And frankly, just as there are times when we must honestly say, I simply don't know for certain what this Bible verse or passage means. There will be in our time and are places in the Greek New Testament where the evidence is not clear cut. The arguments of the various schools of thought do not distinctly favor one reading over another. This means that there will be times, at times, a measure of uncertainty in defining precisely the exact wording of the Greek New Testament, just as there is in the interpretation of specific verses and passages. But this does not mean, and here's the, the main part, I think, of this whole article. This does not mean that there is uncertainty in the theology of the New Testament. Baptist theologian J.L. Dagg has once as well stated the theological limits of the manuscript variation of the New Testament. I'm not going to read that, but it's summarized, I think, much more succinctly, uh, middle of the page. To this may be added the testimony, but please read that top one if you get a chance. Sir Frederick G. Kenyon, the preeminent British authority on New Testament manuscripts at the turn of the 20th century. In discussing the differences between the traditional, uh, that being Textus Receptus, and the Alexandrian type, type text types, in light of God's providential preservation of his word, he writes these words. We may indeed believe that God would not allow his word to be seriously corrupted, or any part of it essential to man's salvation, to be lost or obscured. But the differences between the rival types of text is not one of doctrine. 
No fundamental point of doctrine rests upon a disputed reading. Frame it and put it on the wall. No fundamental point of doctrine rests upon a disputed reading. The truths of Christianity are as certainly expressed in the text of Westcott and Hort as they are in that of Stephanus. Remember, that was a source text for Textus Receptus. Okay? And the very last paragraph says the very same thing. Um, uh, on the last page. Okay, on the very last page, the one, page 8, that has notes, and I didn't copy all the notes for you. I'll just read the last paragraph above the notes header. These sober and sensible judgments stand in marked contrast to the almost manic hysteria found in the writings of some detractors of critical texts who write as though texts were a Pandora's box of heresy. In truth, all text families are doctrinally orthodox. That means faithful to the original doctrinal um, the theology of the New Testament. A dispassionate evaluation of evidence is very much to be preferred to the emotionally charged tirades that characterize much of the current discussion. I would say this. Do not divide over Bible translation. Do not separate brother from brother, sister from sister in the body of Christ over Bible translations. If you do, the error is not in which family of translations is more faithful. The error is in our own hearts that we would take an issue like that and we would cause division in the body of Christ. On the outside of the the outside of St. John's, there was no other Christian style. No. That's right. One by our doctrine. Okay. All right. And, and, and so I would say, I mean, obviously the, the few instances that we looked at, maybe half a dozen total, such minor things that really, is this worth a big discussion? No. That's why we word our doctrinal statements in, its, in the original manuscripts. In the original, in the original manuscripts. In the, yeah. These things, there are variants. Okay. Um, yes. Um, I think you're getting the replay, right? Uh, the book we were just reading, uh, the, uh, uh, the essence of uh, in the Bible, it's getting the, uh, getting the message, getting the message right. um, is uh, punctuated here. And he says you have to read it in context. And so, if one version has something there or not there, mm -hmm. uh, your obligation is to read more of it. And when you read more of it, the small differences get lost. Yeah. It, it, you know, it is insignificant. And I would say, uh, at the end of your notes, you're going to see there's a, a there's a, a little section on families of translations. And what's interesting about the families of translations is that it's not based upon which source manuscripts they drew from. Uh, virtually every modern translation tends to go back to the oldest existent manuscripts. They're almost always collections of reputable scholars, many, many scholars, if you'll, you'll see that. And, uh, and so what, what the differences in translations is not so much the source manuscripts because even the differences that we just pointed out here in the last hour, really minor. What you have in the differences of translations is guidelines for how the translators approached the original manuscripts and then made the transition from the Greek to English and what parameters they used, not necessarily what source documents they used, but what translation parameters they used. That's really where the modern translations vary most one from another, not in their source documents. Okay, Russ, let's just go on for the translations here. Um, the Syriac version, I mentioned that earlier. That was an early, interesting enough, Aramaic translation of the Greek New Testament in 150 AD. Um, there was uh, the Diatessaron composed by Tatian, uh, a very early uh, translation uh, into Latin. Pauline epistles and Acts were translated uh, very early, 5th century, not all of, of the New Testament. Uh, but probably the most ancient, uh, famous translation is Jerome's Latin Vulgate. Uh, translated from the, the Greek manuscripts that he had available, which he's pretty close. You know, 383, he's completed the gospel, so he's only three centuries after, uh, you know, yeah, the last one was written. So that's, that's pretty good. And, uh, and so the Jerome's Latin Vulgate is it's an excellent translation because he's closer to the original manuscripts than anybody in terms of a complete translation. You can see it took him 
you know, 20 some years to complete the entire Bible translation into Latin. The problem, of course, is that if you refer to the Latin to try to figure out what the Greek is, you're a step to a step to a step. And, and there's necessarily going to be, and as I show you a little later, there's going to be some problems with that process. Go ahead, Russ. Wait. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I, I, <laughs> I don't know what you have written down. I'll be going. The next series of sections in your notes we actually covered it, I think, more thoroughly in this article than really I have on this outline up here. So um, everybody's got this part here. Okay, go on. Okay, so this is just a, just a real brief history of you know uh, what, what was going on. Well, for a thousand years of Roman Catholic domination, uh, there wasn't much going on. I mean, it was Latin Vulgate or nothing. Uh, beginning in 1383, uh, we were starting. That was our first translation into English. Uh, Wycliffe. Uh, then. A hundred years later, we have Tyndale, English religious reformer, martyr, whose translation in the New Testament was the basis of the King James Bible. Notice the years, right in there, where uh, that series of, of scholars were beginning to put what became the Texas Receptus source material. Tyndale was important in that. And then, of course, the King James Translation Commission in 1604, finished in 1611, uh, thought to be uh, mostly by um, Erasmus, Dutch scholar. Um, Interesting so I know. And that's 400 years ago, and this is the state year of last year, when mm -hmm. it's the 400th anniversary. Right. And the initial printing of the King James Bible was the first printing in the second printing. And the way they can tell which is which is the first printing has some errors. Has the what? Errors. The errors. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is the mistake. Well, and you see, and there we have it. Yeah. It's not just the scribes who made mistakes. Even the best. Someone is. setting print type can, can there's Video mistakes as well. So that's why you have this whole thing of what's the closest to the original. I think it's a valid question. I just don't think it's worth dividing the body of Christ over. Okay, so, um, yeah. Uh, many modern translations stem from Westcott Court Greek, okay, and then the earliest and best manuscripts. Um, these are the earliest, more or less complete manuscripts that we have of the New Testament in Greek. There's three of them, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and Alexandrinus. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing those right. They don't all agree with each other, all right? So the majority of text, we've talked about that. Um, it's, it's more of a compilation. It pretty much just added them all up. Man, thousand manuscript copies going back to roughly 900 AD, and essentially they just kind of compiled them together. And so there's a lot of agreement there, but as we noted earlier, that tends to be mostly one family of manuscripts, the Byzantine family, and doesn't reflect much in the others. Go ahead, Russ. Where is Sinaiticus, the first one? Well, they, I assume it's the Vatican and Alexander. Yeah. Um, these are, I think it's A and B, Russ. I think when you, I, I'll bring my Greek New Testament to you next time, and you can see it. And when, when you go through and, uh, and you have a, a Bible that references where particular variants in the reading, in other words, differences from whatever you're reading in your translation, they will reference codex. Anybody? What's a codex? A book. A book. Early form of a book, right? You know, primitive, primitive bound uh, papyri. All right, so early books, these were early translations, and these were families, even themselves. They were not a single work by a single person. They tended to be families of translations, but we, we go back to those as source material because they're some of the oldest that we have. We really don't have anything much, much older than that. Even uh, uh, Latin Vulgate was in the fourth century. So uh, that's some of the, the earliest and the best manuscripts that we have, so we tend to go back to those. But even there, they're not all in agreement with each other. But again, the disagreements are not on doctrinal issues, they're on minor points. When your Sinaiticus refers to Sinai Peninsula. And that's the only thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, I, I didn't read about it. Uh, just as a, a point of interest, if you want a good reference, uh, if you want to build your own personal library, uh, I would recommend 
a set of Bible encyclopedias. And the two best sets, they're both five volume sets. One is ISBE, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. And the other one is, one I have in my office. Can you think of one? Well, no. no. Um, Here's what I was referring to earlier. Why are our translations different? It's not so much the source material. You would think that that's, the, that's not really the differences. The difference is what the translators were attempting to accomplish. Parameters, if you will, guidelines for what we have in our English Bible. And here's two general categories. The first one being word for word formal equivalence. The translator attempts to render the exact words form for form or word for word of the original language into the receptor language, Greek to English in this case. In other words, if, if the word is angel in the Greek, then we're going to do angel in the English. But of course the word angel, we're not sure exactly if they understood it as angel, sometimes it's used more in a generic sense to mean the word messenger. So it's not always a, a, a divine creature that lives with God in, a, in another created order, which what we would think of as angels. Sometimes it's actually a messenger. So it's not even that straightforward. But their attempt and why the word-for-word -word translations tend to not read smoothly, because the Greek in, in the original language is not a smooth-flowing language. And that was not one of the parameters. They wanted to stick as close as they could to word for word. It says this in Ephesians 1 in the Greek. Okay, that word equals this in English, that word equals this in English, that word equals this in English, and you get a fairly wooden reading of Ephesians 1 1 because it's formal equivalence. That was their overriding uh, parameter guideline for that translation. Another approach not so slavish, sticking word for word Greek text to English, would be more of a one step removed. What is the best way to express that thought or that idea? We got it in the Greek. That's not how we say that same idea in English using those same word equivalents. How do we best say it in English? Communicating the thought rather than the precise word for words. You see the difference? Those are two huge uh, translation parameter differences that account for a lot of the differences that we have in our English Bibles today. The reproduction and receptor language are the closest natural equivalent of the source language, first in terms of meaning, and second in terms of style. Less concerned about style and word order than they are about that you get what it means. All right? So here are some families of translations, examples. Strictly literal. Um, what you ha what's interesting here is that um, if you were to put a new American Standard next to a King James, New King James, you would find very little difference, very little difference, because they're so close. Strictly literal, New American Standard is a very wooden, uh, sometimes awkward to read text. But of this grouping here, and does include all of the translations we have today, probably the most uh, faithful in a word-for-word -word parameter guideline for translation. Very close would be New King James, Revised Standard, New American Bible. Um, and I would put in the literal group, uh, the most modern one, that is an excellent translation, is the uh, English Standard Version, ESV, which wasn't on this list at the time. Where would you group that? I'd put under literal. It's an excellent translation. Well, what, 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 but, um, well, what's, what's the difference between uh, the English Standard Version and the English Standard Version um, like Anglicized? And I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, there, there's two different versions of the ESP. There's the ESP, then there's ESP Anglicized. I've seen them both. I don't know what the... Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, which one do you have, Linda? Do you know? Uh, it just says ESP. Okay. It's, it's an excellent translation. But you see, everything uh, from here up really is, is 
their, their parameter, their translation guideline, was more of a stick to the word for word equivalence, Greek to English, Greek to English. And that's why they tend to not be as smoothly flowing as this group. This group is more the dynamic equivalence rather than formal equivalence. And so they were seeking more to how do you express that idea best in the English vernacular that we use today? And then you have these translations. All right? It's, they're generally all working from the same source material. In other words, the, the variation is not so much, as I said, since... Uh, here's, a, here's an example. One of the translations says abide in me, and the other one says live in me. That's a, that's a difference. Okay. Um, and the bottom one, paraphrastic, the thing about paraphrases is generally it's the work of uh, just a few individuals. And um, just to complicate you, one more thing here. This is a, if you remember when we got to the end of uh, last time on uh, the authenticity of the Old Testament, we had a short discussion about the the, the Hebrew language is uh, every word is three root consonants, and then they build from that both directions, and that's how we get it. Uh, the Greek language, uh, Koine Greek, which means every man's Greek or common Greek, is just a wonderful language because it can express nuances that English is incapable of doing. So I just I found this. I was looking through, trying to find something pretty simple on verb tense. So if you have this, let me just go through this real quick with you. No element of Greek language is of more importance to the student of the New Testament than the matter of tense. It's a, one of the, the uh, issues with verbs. A variation in meaning exhibited by the use of a particular tense will often dissolve what appears to be an embarrassing difficulty or reveal a gleam of truth which will thrill the heart with delight and inspiration. Though it is an intricate and difficult subject, no phrase of Greek grammar offers a full reward. The benefits are to be reaped only when one has invested sufficient time and diligence to offer an insight into the idiomatic use of tense in the Greek language and appreciation of the finer distinctions. That's a all big quote. Um, so his, his point, last sentence in that paragraph, never neglect to notice the tense of each Greek verb, noted significance and bearing upon the meaning of the passage. We're not going to go into that, but the, the main thing, uh, next paragraph, in English, most and most of the languages, the tense of the verb mainly refers to the time of the action, present, past, future. In Greek, Although time does bear upon the meaning of tense, the primary consideration of the tense of the verb is not time, but rather kind of action that the verb portrays. The most important element in Greek tense is kind of action. Time, when it happens, is regarded as a secondary element. For this reason, many grammarians have adopted... I don't want to go there. Anyway, that's the, the German word for it. Next paragraph. The kind of action of Greek verb will generally fall into these three categories. Continuous, ongoing, progressive kind of action. Completed or accomplished kind of action with continuing results. Or a simple occurrence without reference to the question of progress. Sometimes referred to as punctiliar kind of action. Um, it's action that only happened at one point in time. This can be true, but it's often dependent on other factors. Um, so, Go to the chart. This is, and I just want to show you a couple things. This is really interesting in terms of doctrinal issues. All right, so there you have uh, in the chart that those are the, the the seven tenses, if you will, in uh, Greek. And it, there's the kind of action. Present is progressive or continuous action. Aorist is a punctiliar, simple, or a summary occurrence. Perfect, completed with results, present results, as it says in the next column, the time element. It's a past action, but with present results. All right, and then you can read. I'm going to take you to two verbs that uh, this excites me. Turn to the book of Ephesians. I'm going to show you two verbs in the book of Ephesians, and you can compare them to this chart. And uh, this is why and theology is for next fall. But this is one of the reasons why... I believe that scriptures teach the doctrine of eternal security. Do you understand what the doctrine of eternal security is? The, the, the uh, layman's phrase, although not accurate, uh, phrases this, once saved, always saved. Okay? I would say that 
when God accomplishes the work of salvation in an individual's life, it is accomplished for all time. All right, it's not the work of the individual, it's the work of God's grace. Okay, Ephesians 2, 8. Maybe one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible about the subject of how people are saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Okay. Uh, Thomas, would you read it, please? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that of your own selves, it is a gift of God. The word saved. In the English, we would say what tense is that? <coughs> Past. Past. Right? It's not present. It's not future. We don't really have a lot of options in English. As I say, the Greek is a very precise language. Very precise. Go so down on your chart. The word saved in Ephesians 2.8 is in the perfect tense. Completed in the past with results that continue on into the present and in this case, on into the future. Not having to be repeated, it's a completed action but with continuing results. So which, which tense is it? Perfect. perfect. Yeah. Completed with results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you go to the next, uh, the next column, no, over, it's past tense with present results. All right? But it's not continuous. Not continuous. All right. All right? So a person doesn't need to be saved today, saved tomorrow, saved the next day, saved the next day, saved 10 years from now. It's a completed action in the past. How do I know that? Well, there's a lot of other scriptures that would bear on that. But the tense of the Greek verb, which is so precise, and Paul could have used any one of about four different tenses for the, for the it's the word sozo, that we translate saved. He could have used any one of four other tenses, but he used the perfect tense because it, it's a type of action, not just the time of the action. It's a completed action with results that continue into the future. I think that is so cool that God was so precise about an issue that is so important to us. When God accomplishes the salvation of any sinner, it's does that mean that person is never going to sin again? No, it doesn't mean that. All right, one other verb, though, often confused. Go to 5.18, Ephesians 5.18. I want you to see what verb tense this is. Again, a controversial issue. Ephesians 5.18. <clears throat> okay, Karen, did you read 5.18, please? Yeah. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Filled. Filled looks like what kind of a verb in English? It looks like past. Look at your chart. Yeah. I think filled is present. Russell Top line. That is a progressive or continuous action. We are filled yesterday, but yesterday's filling doesn't carry over to today. We got to be filled again today. We might not be filled again in an hour, but filled because of the tense verb, the type of action. It's a continuous action that keeps having to repeat itself. Well, it's okay. not completed once for all with results that continue in the past, in the future. That's perfect tense. That's saved. But to be filled by the Holy Spirit is an ongoing, continuous process that has to go on. We don't necessarily get that from the English, because English is not a precise language in the verbs. But in God's sovereignty, he inspired the New Testament, which I believe the, the most important truths that mankind will ever consider or believe or act upon in a very, very precise, nuanced language, which is Koine Greek. That is exciting to me to think about. I'm going to do one with verbs for you, I mean with nouns, real quick. We're just about out of time. In English, I say, I love Linda. I love chocolate. I love, we went cross country skiing on a sunny day today. I love to cross country ski in the sunshine. I love my children. I love reading God's Word. You love your dog. Yeah, I don't have a dog, but I would love my dog if I had a dog. I did love your dog. Yeah, I did love my dog. So, it, with one English word, L O V E, I've expressed at least five different kinds of love. Now, we kind of know the differences, although some people would say, is loving your dog different than loving your wife? You would hope so. 
right? But English doesn't express that. <laughs> Actions don't express that. <laughs> There might be some guys that would question. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not sure. But okay. So English, you know, we understand the differences, but we're still using the same word. Greek, again, much more precise, has five different words to express what I just expressed, all using one English word. And just, it just out of curiosity, here they are. And and uh, and where I cover this is uh, uh, when I am uh, doing. Do you remember this? I do. You do remember this, see? Because I did the premarital counseling with Sean and, and his wife Chelsea, and, and I give them a resource that talks about these five different ways. And I said, these are the five different ways that you should love your spouse. All right? Five different words. You don't need to copy them down. I'm just doing this for just the, the precision of the Greek language. Um, one word is the word epithemia, and it means a strong desire for something to set your heart upon. I love to go hunting. I have a strong desire to go hunting. Is that the same desire that I have for my children, for my savior, for my spouse? No, it's a different word. It's a strong desire to do something chocolate, right? Eros. Most of us know what that word means. It's a word for we get erotic. It's sexual desire, all right? It's a form of love, all right? Uh, storge, you may not have heard of that. It's a comfortable old shoe kind of love relationship. Um, frankly, it's the way parents and children are. We never question our, our love for our kids. We love them from day one, we're gonna love them no matter what they do, for as long as they live. It's as comfortable as an old shoe. We don't even have to think about it, question it. It's hard sometimes, but it's not something that, that ever comes up as, do we stop doing this? No, we don't ever, right? So that's store game. Fill that out. That's one we're more familiar with. That's a friendship. That's camaraderie. That's often what we experience in the body of Christ. Something in common that we have. All right? And the last one, though, you know the one I'm going to talk about, is agape. A unique love that has its source in only one person, and that is God. God is agape. 1 John 4. God is love. But it is a special kind of love, and it's defined for us in the New Testament as sacrificial love. Agape love always does what is in the best interest for the object of its love without counting cost to self. God so agape the world that he did what had to be the hardest thing that God could do, send his only begotten son to be tortured and crucified on a cross, and killed and separated during those three hours of darkness so that whoever believes in him should have eternal life and not perish. Agape love, divine love. We can only agape love as we are related to God. It is a love that is impossible for another human being to express or to engage in with another person apart from God's life flowing through us to another person. That's the precision of the Greek language. It is a wonderful language that we have, and, then, and, and very faithfully translated, but English has its limitations. And that's the language we speak. But it just thrills me that God chose such a precise language to communicate the most important truths ever in the history of mankind. Was it by chance, of course? We, we could have had another discussion about Hebrew, but um, anyway, any other comments? We're out of time here, so. Because of this, possibly, he was careful to have the Gospels written four times. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. We need to stop. Uh, sure. Any Lord, well, we do thank you that you have preserved your word for us. And Lord, as we, as we question, perhaps, and, and get maybe discouraged, or, or people want to argue about the translations, Lord, we do realize that the most important translation is that which is lived out in our lives. As we hear your word and obey your word. I thank you, Lord, for the truth. We thank you for the confidence that we have in, in your word. We thank you that we have experienced its power in our lives. As you speak your word to us, we receive your grace. 
We pray, Lord, you'd help us to continue to seek after you, that we would be like Jeremiah, who, who found your word, who sought after it and found your word and ate it, and it was the, the joy of his heart. May it bring great joy in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So,